So, welcome to the first lecture. And by the way, I, I, I want to begin by saying thank you. Um, I didn't realize till yesterday how much I miss this, and, and I'm, I miss it a lot. Uh, I enjoy being able to pace around back and forth up here and talk to you guys. Uh, and so it's a real pleasure that, that this was important enough to so many of you that you really made it obvious to me that you know, this was something you wanted done. So we're going to have five of these. Uh, this first one is going to be COVID related. It was kind of funny. After the talk yesterday, a, a guy sheepishly raised his hand and said, sir, I know I get it. COVID's a big thing, and we're, but we're just constantly being COVIDed these days. Could, you, could the following lectures be on something else? Uh, and I agree, I get it, um, and, and they will be. Uh, so this one will have a COVID focus, uh, but the other ones will be much more psychology and other world events perhaps, um, but, but I won't, I'll try to make this a place where you can get away from COVID uh, for a little while uh, after, this, after this lecture. You ain't getting away today. Okay, let's jump in. Um, there's, a, there's this notion in psychology called the common enemy and most psychologists prior to the pandemic, if they knew a pandemic was coming, they would probably have seen a real silver lining, but that silver lining didn't emerge. So the silver lining is around the common enemy. So we can go back to you know, Aristotle, a common enemy unite, or a common danger rather, unites even the bitterest of enemies. And this is a, this is a notion that we see repeated uh, many times in many different places. The idea is if you want people to work together in some way, give them a common enemy. And if they have this common enemy, they will suddenly work together. And so think of you know, war and, and think of like the world wars where you had the allies who may not have necessarily liked each other, let's say France and England, um, for, for example. But when you have Nazi Germany, then suddenly those two countries see a lot more that they're alike than different and, and they can become united. And so there was the hope at the beginning of this pandemic, the, the belief, I think, that most psychologists would have, including myself, that if something like a pandemic came, it could be good for us. It might actually get us to stop having the stupid fights humanity has because we have to unite to take on the virus, right? Um, and so this is, this is the sort of hope um, that would come from it. And it's, by the way, based on, I know you can't read this very well, and don't worry about that, I just want to show you, this is the famous, um, from Musafar Sharif, the famous so-called Robbers Cove experiment, where he created prejudice amongst kids, which sounds kind of nasty. He made two groups that were otherwise just two random groups, made them behave prejudicially towards each other, and showed that, that how prejudice is actually born, so to speak. But, won't tell you that story right now, but after that, after he created the prejudice, he needed, these, the, he needed to get rid of it, right? And, and how do you get rid of it once you have two groups of people who don't like each other? Well, he gave them common enemies. So there were two groups of kids at a camp, and there were things like the water basin at the camp seemed to be low, and, and they need some way to fill it, and they needed all the boys to participate together to be able to do that. So they started coming up with these problems that these groups could only solve together. Uh, and, and Sharif's research shows that this made a lot of their bitterness and a lot of their sort of prejudicial dislike of each other sort of evaporate and disappear. So it's not only a nice philosophical conf, uh, concept, it's a psychological concept supported by empirical data. Did it work though in the real world? Well, let's get there. Before we get there, I just wanna ask you a few questions. And so you can use the Top Hat um, app to answer these questions as well. This first one is not really a trick question, but it's sort of a trick question. The next two will make sense. Um, but I'll just ask you to uh, answer this question, please. And yeah, those of you playing along at home, welcome as well. Uh, you should be able to use the app. You should be able to use that back chat as well, uh, along with being able to answer these questions along with the people in the class. That's why, by the way, we're seeing 97 responses when there aren't 97 here. Um, it's because we have a home audience, which is fantastic. Um, excellent. Okay, so I'm just going to move on, even though some of you might not have totally responded yet. Uh, Lauren, a couple more at the door there. Um, and we're just going to see, oh, 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 this is a problem. <laughs> I joked about this yesterday. I said, okay, we got a zero in the anti-vaxxer. I, I'm going to assume that anti-vaxxer is watching from home. <laughs> I assume. 
if they're here, that's not good. You're not supposed to be here. Um, so surely you're not here. Uh, I'd like to ask that anti-vaxxer now on a back chat. Um, are you, so yes, hidden, yes. Okay, I'm gonna assume that's the anti-vaxxer. They're watching from home. Cool. I like that an anti-vaxxer too is watching. It would be interesting to hear their perspective on my perspective. So we'll see how that goes. Um, all right, now here's the ones I'm a little more interested in your answers to. Are any of your friends anti-vaxxers? So you see sort of three categories there. None, one, or yes. <laughs> I've got a bunch. I've got some friends that are anti-vaxxers. All right, again, wow. Thank you for answering quickly. That just allows us to move along here. Um, and so 87 say no, but you know, look, there's a pretty good chunk here. 37 people who have uh, friends in a pr relatively small group of people. You know, what, what is that? Maybe 20% or more uh, of, of the respondents here have a friend who's an anti-vaxxer. Now let's take it a step more intimate, shall we? Do you have any close family members? The are anti-vaxxers. And so now let me say, this is a personal issue for me. And it's one I've thought about a lot. Uh, I have three older sisters, including the oldest sister who we were the closest forever in our family. She is a staunch anti-vaxxer. Not only that, she has power of attorney over my mother who has uh, Alzheimer's disease and is in a long-term care facility. Because my sister does not believe in the vaccine, my mom is not getting the vaccine. My sister has the power to decide, and she's decided that my mom will also not get vaccinated. This has caused a major issue between my sister and I. We cannot speak. Um, it's a big scar, and many people are going through that with friends or with family. So here we're seeing you know, over 50 people out of 200 so 25% of people um, have this division within their family. And, and this is a division that, in, in my case at least, will live on post-pandemic. You know, I have absolutely no doubt there will be a scar from this that's going to be hard for my sister and I to ever overcome, even though we both want it badly. It's going to be very hard. So why am I saying this stuff? We're going to talk about anti-vaxxers, and, and I want to be clear at the beginning, I know it's a broad spectrum. You can't paint them all with one brush. And at times I will seem guilty of doing that. Um, and at times I may seem guilty of being judgmental towards them. But I want us to all start by realizing these are our brothers and sisters. These are our fellow citizens of, of Canada. These are not people who are trying to be a pain in the ass. Even if we think they are, that is not what they think. That is not where they're coming from. We're going to talk a little bit about how we got to this divided place, but we have to keep that humanity in mind even as we think through this. Okay, so I, I really think it's important that we say that at the outset. We care about these people. We don't hate them. They are our neighbors. They are our brothers and sisters. We just want them to come on side and, and, and do what we believe is the right thing to do. So I throw this graphic up here just quickly just to show you. Uh, don't worry too much about the details. But this is not a local issue. You know, this is a global perspective. And the red part kind of gives you a sense of how strongly, especially the deep red, the sort of anti-vax sentiment is in those countries. There was always anti-vax sentiment, even before the pandemic. But it was around 2 or 3%. So there might be 2 or 3% of people who had trouble, for example, with having their children vaccinated in schools. And so they might have homeschooled or chose other options um, because of that. Uh, but when it's 2 or 3%, society can tolerate that because as long as the rest get vaccinated, herd immunity is there. But when it's, well, what do we now know? You know, if you have something like the Delta variant that's quite aggressive, you need somewhere like 85 to 90% or more of the population to be vaccinated to get that herd immunity. To, so the virus doesn't have enough host to spread. And what these numbers show us is that because of these concerns over the vaccine, we don't have those numbers. Well, actually in Canada, we're pretty lucky. We're pretty darn close, especially in Ontario. But in many places of the world, this anti-vax sentiment could prevent herd immunity, allowing the virus to continue 
to you know, expand and mutate and eventually maybe come and get all of the vaccinated people too. So it's a problem. You know, we have to find a solution to this. Part of the solution is understanding how we got here. So really there's two questions that I will argue are critical that we think about, although you'll see that weird third question there too. We'll come to that. But are vaccines effective and are vaccines safe? It seems like we cannot even agree on the answers to these two questions, right? Those who believe in vaccines and those who are anti. They, they see the answers to these questions as completely different. They're pretty straightforward questions. They are ones that you should be able to answer with proper data. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about how this became such a problem, but I do want to kind of bring you there gradually. So here's what we're going to do uh, in the next little bit. I'm going to start with a sort of heart and mind thing up in the left. You'll see it's really brain and brain, midbrain and cortex. Um, but we, we, we think of emotion and we think of rationality in terms of heart and mind. Uh, and so I'm going to start talking about that because we need that as a context for the subsequent discussions. We're then going to talk about, okay, how did we get to this spot? What happened to the common enemy? The common enemy was supposed to unite us. Why do we still have, let's say, 20% of the people who are not willing to unite with the 80%. How did this happen? And, and I think we'll learn a lot about psychology and think about a lot about the psychology of how we got there, uh, how we got to this part. And of course, all through in and out, we're gonna talk about the scientific method and how it um, connects to this and why it should be the solution, but then why it isn't, you know, why it hasn't done what we think science should do. Uh, that's the journey we're going to take. And we're going to start with what I call the two of us. Whenever I'm talking to the media or the general public about anything almost related to psychology, a place where I like to start is to really convince people there's really two of us. Um, there is an emotional us and there is a rational us. Now, you guys will start learning about the biology of the brain. And so, you know, we talk about heart and mind, but this is the reality. Here's the real two of us so to speak. Let's start over here, the limbic system on, on, the, on the right side here. If you took a bunch of animals and you looked at their brains in detail, you would find, although there's some differences in terms of shape and size, almost every animal has almost a complete limbic system. This limbic system is a, is a, um, a solution, a biological solution to the dangers that living animals face that has been highly successful enough so that every animal uses this pretty much the same system. We've had this for millennia and it's core, it's literally in the core of our brain and it's literally in the core of us. This system handles instinctual behaviors, handles habitual behaviors, uh, and is really the home of emotion, the seed of emotion. Emotion triggers this system into life um, and it itself feeds emotion more. Okay, so we'll learn a little bit about it as the emotional part of the brain. Now, if we go over here, these are, this is the frontal lobes, but specifically the blue part of those frontal lobes, the so-called prefrontal cortex. The prefrontal cortex is where we do all of our rational thinking, all of our strategi strategizing. So, you know, what do you want to be when you grow up? Okay, I want to be X. Well, what do you need to be doing to get to be X? And so you plan what courses you want to take, et cetera. Um, and it's all based on these goals you have, strategies to reach those goals. That's the frontal lobes, okay? First important point here, the frontal lobes are the new kid in town, okay? When it comes to brain, the limbic region has been around forever. The frontal lobes much, much more recently evolved. And the frontal lobes, of course, is how we differ from a lot of animals. We have way more cortex in general, but frontal lobe especially. And you know that's why we build things like this and, and do things other animals don't do because we can strategize and, and think about things in such a, a detailed way. Uh, we can bring things in their mind to life in the external world, et cetera. Uh, but when push comes to shove, emotion wins. The emotional part of us is much more powerful than we typically give it credit for. 
We like to think of ourselves as rational all the time. We like to think we do the things we do and we like the things we like for rational reasons. But the chances are the reason you dress the way you dress is because people you like and admire dress that way. Um, and it's, it's something that it's an emotional kind of connection with those people. A lot of the decisions we make are more done at, with it, without any conscious idea of what's really going into those decisions. We love the rational part of ourselves and we're aware of it when it's working, but the emotion side is strong and not just that, it can take over. So let's just talk about this limbic system a little bit more to set the stage again of primary function of the limbic system is to keep us alive when we're in a dangerous situation. When there's some sort of threat, some sort of danger, we all have this thing called the amygdala. We have two of them actually, one on each side of our brain, kind of almond shaped little um, bits of brain. <laughs> uh, they are like the spider sense. If you watch Spider-Man, you know, Spider-Man, oh, my spider sense is tingling, there's danger around. Well, all of the information from the external world um, is accessible to the amygdala. And the amygdala scans that information looking for threat or danger. And if it finds threat or danger, it kicks in what we call our sympathetic nervous system. It's the nervous system that connects our body to our brain, our brain to our body, all the nerve fibers, but it works a lot too with hormones. So very often the brain will release certain hormones which trigger our body into, well, into what? Into this thing called fight or flight mode, um, which is as it sounds. So let me give you a story so that you kind of understand how this works. Imagine you had a hard day. Um, and you're home, you're relaxing, you're kicking back on the couch, you're watching The Voice Blind Auditions, which is what you love. Everything is cool, but you're home alone. And upstairs, suddenly in your house, you hear a window smash. Okay, you're gonna go from this relaxed mode, which we call the parasympathetic mode or the rest and digest mode. Um, you're gonna very quickly, your amygdala is gonna go danger and you're gonna fight, flee or freeze. We sometimes add this freeze. So sometimes people sit there for a second and go, oh, what do I do? But, but they're listening very carefully. They're hyper attentive. They feel all this energy in their body because what this system is doing is preparing our body for action. It's preparing us to do something. And it kind of comes with that imperative, do something. Either go up there and deal with this, whatever's going on, or get yourself the heck out of there. Those are the two ways you're going to survive. You're either going to meet the threat head on and defeat it, or you're going to escape it. And that's what you got to do, okay? So that's what the system kicks in, is that sort of behavior. And when it does, super critically, it, it kind of shuts down the frontal lobes. It is kind of like the reaction that happens in your brain is, there's danger out there. This is not time for thought. This is not time for strategy. This is time for action. And don't try to make it complicated. It's not complicated. You either go after that thing or you get away from it. That easy. So this is that simple core system that has been critical for keeping animals alive for years and years. The rabbit that spots the hawk, you know, and starts to see the hawk is coming towards it. This system kicks in and it runs like heck and does its little dart thing and escapes, you know, because it's got all this power and strength that comes from the system being kicked in which by the way is comes from your heart beating faster, flooding your body with oxygen rich. So you breathe harder too, and, you, and your body gets flooded with oxygen rich blood, which makes your muscles really strong, makes you stronger than you ever are. So it's a little superhero in us that comes out in these situations. Very useful, right? A very effective reaction. If somebody walked in here right now, and threatened us in some way. Imagine someone with a baseball bat was coming after her for some reason, we don't know. We see that person with a baseball bat coming with bad intent hard, then we're either gonna take them on, hopefully, we, that would be the heroic thing to do, right? <laughs> or we're all gonna run away and save ourselves. Um, but, but that will help us, that will help us survive another day. Okay, so emotion, rationality, emotion wins. Okay, let me take a quick little look here. See if this is working and see where we're at. Is the emotional and rational part like psychoanalysis, the id, super ego, and ego? No. Um, psychoanalysis, we're, we'll talk about a little bit. You'll get it a lot in AO2. 
it's a far more theoretically complex kind of notion about all these underlying desires and things like that. I'm talking biology, really. I'm talking much uh, simpler level. These are just biological responses. This fight flight is called, it's an instinct that's just triggered uh, by, by danger. Um, and the frontal lobe is doing rational thought. That's just what they do. Um, the psychoanalytic theory is much more complex. So we'd have to talk about that a lot more to, to connect the two. Some people consider the government an enemy while others consider COVID an enemy. Yeah, we're gonna talk about that. Absolutely, herd immunity is important. Excellent, excellent, excellent. And thank you for the kind words about my mom. Okay. So how did we get here? Again, I think it's really important that we don't just demonize anti-vaxxers, that we don't just make them seem like they're these stupid, ignorant people. Um, we can fall prey to that too easily, and that's not going to help us get together. So part of that understanding is understanding how we got to be so separated. And so I'm going to talk more about not really them, because I can't speak for all anti-vaxxers. Um, I can speak a little for my sister, uh, so I can give you a sense of how she got where she is. Uh, and I think the path that she took uh, will illustrate a lot of things that other people are also encountering. So a lot of these facets are common. So way pre-pandemic, long before any of this started, there were a lot of people worried about big pharma, okay? Also big food. Uh, the idea behind the big pharma worries was that pharmaceutical companies were producing drugs, even drugs that we didn't really need, but then convincing doctors to please convince patients that they need these drugs. Uh, and so the big pharma worry says, you know, we're just getting too much. Doctors are just prescribing drugs like crazy to everybody. And of course, once you're on that first long-term drug, it has side effects. So now the pharmaceutical company produces drugs to help deal with the side effects of the drugs they sold you last time. And so suddenly you have people, honestly, like my mom, who at some point in her life was probably taking a handful of seven or eight pills, you know, every day, um, because she was the kind that went to the doctor to get pills for whatever. And so there were a lot of people like my sister watching my mom, you know, doing this, really thinking there's sneaky stuff going on there. These guys are profit driven. They are, and this is going to become a core theme, getting back to that government's the enemy kind of thing. Collusion by those with power and wealth to take advantage of the average human being. That concept, that meme, if you'd like, was out pre way pre-pandemic. Um, and a lot of people were worried about this. Same with big food. They were worried that, that food suppliers are putting a bunch of sugar and fat in foods, making people addicted to unhealthy, non-nutritious food. Is there anything to any of these worries? I would say yes. You know, I would say at this point, a lot of these people, while maybe exaggerating the problem, there was a problem. There is a problem. I do think we prescribe too many drugs. And I do think there are forces of the economy at play that are supporting that. And so there were a lot of people in this space, which was not really a crazy space. It was more like, a, we got to keep an eye on these, this. We can't let things kind of continue in that. Something critical happened during that time. And I, I, last, last, yesterday I dwelt a little too long on this, I think. So I'm gonna to try to go a little quicker, but there's some really critical points here that we have to talk about. A paper came out in 1998, as alluded to here, uh, by Andrew Wakefield. <clears throat> so he published this case series that showed or suggested that um, the measles, mumps, and rubella vaccine may predispose to behavioral regression and pervasive developmental disorder in children. This was really linked to autism. And, and a lot of you guys have heard this, vaccines cause autism. Where did that idea came from? It came from Wakefield, okay? He published that, that paper in The Lancet. The Lancet's gonna be a bit of a villain here, but it's also going to be something that we, there's a lot of lessons to be learned from this story. So it's a very important story. So look at this, despite the small sample size, the uncontrolled design and the speculative nature of the conclusions, the paper received wide publicity. I actually think there's something critical missing before that. Like after they said the uncontrolled design, the speculative nature of the conclusions, it should never have been published, right? So one of the, we're, we're gonna talk about how reliable sources and science have various ways of making sure what is out there is accurate. 
And one of the ways is peer review. Before anything is published, three other experts in the field check it out and say it's worthy. It's of a quality to be published. There was a failure that happened here. This should never have been published. And if it would have never been published, we wouldn't be here. I claim this is the seed of the tree we're now seeing, okay? It was published, shouldn't have been published, shouldn't have made it. It received wide publicity and suddenly parents started saying, I don't want my kid vaccinated. There's a lot of autism out there. I don't know what causes it. Maybe it's the vaccine. Let's avoid vaccines, okay? Now, if you follow the story, almost immediately afterwards, all these studies were conducted um, and they all, none of them supported that original result. Um, and, and they said, you know, it, it's easy for people to say that the vaccines cause autism because we see both, both of these, when, when we vaccinate our kids is around the same age we see autistic tendencies start to show up. And so it's easy to draw a correlation, just that temporal correlation, right? Oh, they got the vaccine and then they got this. Well, yeah, and they also probably lost a tooth during that period. Did the vaccine make them lose a tooth? You know, there's all these things that happen at that period. So, so they started to say, not only is there no evidence, but, but probably the logic that, that brought people there was faulty. Next episode, 10 of the 12 co-authors of the original paper um, retract it. And, and they say there was no causal link. Now, this sounds a little confusing. Why would they have agreed to be on a paper where they said there was, and now they say there isn't? You'll get the answer to that in a moment. Um, but according to the ret retraction, there was no link between them. Uh, and this was accompanied by an admission of the Lancet that Wakefield had failed to disclose financial interests. Uh, basically, he was being funded, his research was being funded by lawyers that were going after the drug companies, going after Big Pharma. And so they needed data to suggest that Big Pharma was to blame for autism. Um, and, and he provided that data. But obviously the ethics of this get a little sus suspect, right? If he's getting funding to give them the data they want to win money for their clients, this starts to feel a little slimy in the scientific case. Lancet said, we're not going to, we're not going to see this as an ethical violation. Another screw up by the Lancet. Um, there's going to be a few. The Lancet gets a little better. So this is the, this is the, the rest of the story, um, but um, important parts here too. So eventually, the Lancet completely retracts the Wakefield paper in 2010. So look at that, 12 years of, of kind of floating around with this paper, um, adding that several elements were incorrect and contrary to the findings, um, Wakefield were held guilty of ethical violations uh, and scientific misrepresentation. This retraction was published as a small anonymous paragraph on the journal on behalf of the editors. So this is good and bad. So one thing I want to point out here is if it's a reliable source, and the Lancet is generally considered a reliable source, this is the kind of thing reliable sources do when they get it wrong, okay? They issue retractions, they take that, that hit in the reputation, that's why you're seeing small anonymous, they're trying to minimize the reputation hit the Lancet's taking, but they're at least saying, we shouldn't have done that, we're retracting that, that was a mistake, um, etc. And the final episode here, um, was where they say, this is why the co-authors ultimately retracted. Um, the final episode is they found out that Wakefield Al was Gilbert, uh, guilty of deliberate fraud. He selected, they selected the data from a, from a large available data set. They only selected the data that fit with what they were trying to argue. And if you looked at the entire data set, there was no connection. There was no relationship there. So what do we have? You know, a fraudulent, unethical scientific paper that should never have been published but was, and that immediately all of the research conducted showed the conclusions were wrong, and there's all these reasons to believe that there's nefarious intent. Uh, intent. So what should have happened? We should have just forgotten about that paper. It should have died, that Wakefield paper, in disgrace. It did not die in disgrace. It lived on. And it has grown into the tree we see today. Why? What, what went wrong here? To understand that, you have to understand something called the mere exposure effect. Um, psychological phenomenon, very simply put, the more often you have experience with something, whatever that something could be, the more you tend to like it. Okay, originally, um, you, something that's new is sort of odd, unusual, unfamiliar, but the more familiar and comfortable it gets, the more you tend to like it. 
Uh, this is true also about things you hear. The little twist. The more you tend to hear it, the more you like it, and the more you tend to believe it. It feels true. Something you hear a lot, especially from different places, especially if it's from someone you, you like and trust or admire, um, the more likely it is you're going to believe that. Okay, why is this relevant? This next step explains why it's happening now, why, we haven't, why a common enemy has been effective in the past for bringing humans together, but not this time. Where does your information come from? Let me just put both of those up. Pre-social media, almost all the information people got came from so-called reliable sources, newspapers, TV news, radio news, you know, those sorts of things. All of these sources engage in fact-checking, okay? They don't, when I am a, a so-called expert on one of these things, if I make any claims, they want to see the evidence that supports my claims. Um, they don't want somebody on their show just, you know, doing all these, saying all these wild and crazy things because they have a reputation and they have accountability. So when, kind of like the Lancet, when they accidentally allow misinformation to get out there, they have mechanisms that immediately say, oh my goodness, we made a mistake. We have to publish a retraction. We have to do something. You know, this is our reputation on the line. We don't want to be known as a fake news spreader because we have a brand, right? Of a sort. And we have to protect that brand. Okay. Social media is very different. Social media, there's no fact checking. Anybody can post anything, anytime. And it gets published as written with nobody intervening, nobody fact checking. There's no accountability when errors are made. You don't see people with many of these posts say, oh, well, you know what, I, I did some misinformation there, I'm sorry, because there's not really a brand, right? These become posts that just get out there and shared and become very powerful. And as you'll see in a moment, um, we don't, uh, they don't often attribute the original source. They don't really tell you where the original source was, and there's a reason for that. Um, and so they certainly don't feel like there's any accountability when errors are made. And now here's this important part. If it was a newspaper story and you read it, you read it if, it, if it impacted you, if it was pretty powerful, you might talk to some friends about it. But that's about how it spreads, right? On social media, if you read something, and it impacts you, and it's powerful. If you hit that share button, you're now sharing the story as written with how many ever people get your news feed. There's a multiplier ad effect here that can take some bit of erroneous news and in its original form, multiply it all over the place, going viral, so to speak. And these are the forces that have driven the anti-vax sentiment. They almost always, anti-vaxxers, one of the first things my sister used to say to me um, when we spoke was, turn off your TV. Don't believe anything you see on TV. It's all bull crap. Wow, what a big claim. We'll get to that in a moment. But she got all her news from social media, from links being sent around and shared. It's a dangerous place to get your news. It's a very dangerous place, especially if you think this news is as good as this news because it's not. It simply has not been vetted for quality um, or for accuracy. And that's a critical thing. But it's also critical because the people doing this know what they're doing, okay? You've probably seen this. Two thirds of the anti-vax posts were created by 12 individuals. I don't know, one of them's a pair, <laughs> but roughly. 12 people, well, I guess, no, oh, that is 12. Oh, I guess the pairs included is too, excellent. 12 people, two thirds of the anti-vax sentiment that's out there. This phenomenon that we're facing is largely due to that paper that should never have been published and these 12 individuals who are able to take things like that and suddenly make it out there. So now suddenly everybody knows about that original paper. Nobody knows everything I told you about it being retracted and the embarrassment and it was unethical. They don't share that. That doesn't get shared. What gets shared is Wakefield et al. show there was a link between vaccines and whatever. 
right? That you can never do that on a news thing. If you did that and people were aware that that was a disgraced paper, you would look like an idiot, right? And, and nobody would go trust your channel anymore. Social media, they, they can do those sorts of things. And they don't do it, well, let me say it this way. These are crafted pieces and they're crafted in an important way. They're crafted in an emotional heavy way. So let's talk about one example to make that a little clear. Perhaps the first example um, that kind of led us to, to some of this bigger conspiracy. Remember I told you there's the big pharma conspiracy, but this becomes a meme that kind of grows and becomes bigger to this government conspiracy, right? It's the government that's the enemy. How did we go from big pharma to Doug Ford? Um, I don't know, Doug Ford's kind of funny on this one, but anyway, how do we go from big pharma to the government uh, being responsible? This was part of that trajectory. So early on was the notion of Pizzagate, right? If you guys haven't seen Pizzagate stuff, check it out afterwards. It's, it's kind of weird. But the notion was, the story was this. Um, it's centered around Hillary Clinton and the Democrats. Republicans hate Hillary Clinton. She is the enemy for some reason. They really, really don't like Hillary Clinton. So first of all, let's capitalize on that. Here's a villain, at least for, the, for, for a lot of the people who are going to read this. And this villain has this pizza shop that looks like a pizza shop at the top, but downstairs, it's a child porn factory. They are kidnapping children. They are forcing them to do sexual acts. They are videotaping it. And they are a bunch of pedophiles are sharing this stuff uh, in this pizza un basement of a pizza place. Okay, that's emotional, right? If you care about kids, the idea that a bunch of pedoph pedophiles have some factory for child porn um, in, in a neighborhood pizza shop, that is shocking. That is scary. That's what they're trying to do. Remember, two things I told you about emotional messages that trigger the fight or flee. One is they shut down the frontal lobe. Makes it really hard for the reader to think logically and rationally about all the details in the story because they're wrapped up in the emotionality. The emotion really makes them angry and does what? Want, makes them want to do something. Do something. That's what our ancient part of our brain says. Do something. Well, what can I do? I just read this on social media. What can I? Oh, I could share it. I could like it. I can comment if I wish. Those are the three things that social media allows me to do with this post. And so if I feel compelled to do something, the emotionality makes it harder for me to think deeply about what's being said and easy for me to share. Perfect breeding ground for misinformation spread. Okay, It's really kind of a, a classic way of using the brain, um, the, the note, this, this tendency of the brain to allow emotion to take over and triggering that in a way that will lead to the optimal spread of misinformation. How can 12 people be responsible for 66% of the misinformation? Because they know how to write something that spreads. They know how to make a story go viral. Um, and and you know, that's a, a really powerful thing, but it's a powerful thing being used in a very destructive way now. Okay, actually, if you just came in, if I could just get you to sign in over here, just for contact tracing reasons, thank you. So, just a couple, let me just throw these real quick. A few take homes here. The emotionality of message again, makes it harder to think rashly, makes it easier for sh to share. There's other aspects here too. Once you do that, so we're again, we're talking about sort of how did we get so far apart, the, the pro-vax and the anti-vax. So say you are sort of a big pharma person and now you see some story that stirs you up emotionally and you share that. What you're almost going to immediately discover is you've just come into contact with a community of very active people who all feel we need to do something because they're all in the same thing. And they will welcome you with open arms to their community. You will immediately find many others who are worried about all of these things, who are glad you are worried too. And wow, if you didn't have a community before, if you felt at all lonely or separated, you got a community, man, right away. That's a powerful psychological thing. It's a powerful psychological thing, social connections. You see a weird sort of sub part of this. I think of Tucker Carlson, for, for those of you who you know, follow any of this stuff. But also, if you're an individual with any credibility, and you then join, you then somehow support this, 
now you're going to become a hero really quickly. You know, if you are somebody that the world kind of trusts. So let's say I, I'm not that I have that great of a reputation, but I have a bit of a reputation. If I suddenly became a staunch anti-vaxxer, I can guarantee you there would be a whole bunch of anti-vaxxers that would suddenly love me. I would feel adulation. I would feel like, wow, they really are so happy that I'm, that I'm doing what I'm doing. That's a powerful force too. And so we're seeing they often point to individuals. This person, this person, this person, this person says we're not crazy. Well, okay, big deal. Um, that's not how we decide who wins you know, uh, on, on things like this. But this is part of that whole phenomenon. Okay, so I hope you're kind of, um, I'll, I'll stop in here for, for a moment um, just to take a look, but I hope you're getting the sense now of, you know, these are not just angry people that chose a cause. They are people who, were, who, who believe they're trying to do a right thing and who've been subjected to a bunch of misinformation, targeting their emotional centers and really kind of pulling them along this path, which they then get embraced by the community when they do. Um, and so they speak out more because the community loves that. And every step of the way, they're getting further and further from us, okay? But there are brothers, there are neighbors, uh, there are sisters. Let's think about that. Um, farming, uh, big pharma companies are big capitalistic bodies that have a history of being exploitive. So we're seeing somebody kind of endorse that. You know, that is the big pharma idea. And I don't think that's totally wrong. I mean, I think there's, there's issues in there for sure. Um, how would you run away from these emotional responses, uh, posts, the flight response? Great example. Uh, great question. Um, fight or flight? Why don't people flee? You can flee, but it doesn't feel like you're doing anything if you're fleeing, right? So I kind of flee. Uh, I find a bunch of things on my Facebook page. It's kind of funny. This is my way of dealing with anxiety. People who post far side comics. There's this guy in Fredericton where I grew up named Bert Green. He was my math teacher. He's the most positive individual I've ever seen. He sings in his car, he gives people gifts. He's saying good things about everything. I like everything he does and he features in my feed. He makes me feel good. It's my way of fleeing this stuff. So, so some of us do flee it, right? If, if you're a vaxxer, do you read those posts carefully? Or do you just read the headline and go, oh, man, and you flee it. You know, it may cause you to be emotional and some may flee, but it's the fighters that are fueling this because they're sharing. So, so great point there. Yeah. Yep. Chris Sky needs to be part of those 12 influencers. Oh, interesting. So there may be some other people kind of going on there. Um, so I think polarization on social media also plays a role. So that's absolutely true too. When you have um, a place, so-called echo chambers, right? Where you can go and hang out with a bunch of people who believe what you believe, then that makes you really strong in your beliefs. And so if you have the vaxxers going to sort of one group and you have the anti-vaxxers going to another group, as they do, they're becoming more and more extremists in their position, so to speak, which means they're getting further and further away. Um, so that is a problem. Okay, let's continue the story. And we're kind of getting to the point now of, well, what are we going to do about it? So these are the kind of forces that have pulled 20% of us in this anti-vaxxer place, while the other 80% know that we need those 20%. We need them to get herd immunity. We need them to get past this pandemic. How are we going to get by here? Our first logical thought, because we love our frontal lobes, is we'll be rational about this. And we've been trying to do this for a year and a half. Uh, I've been arguing for about the last half or more a year with media sources, that we should give up on this and go a different route that we'll talk about in a moment, because we did, we are going that different route now. Um, but for a lot of time, what did we do? Well, if we had an anti-vaxxer in our life, we tried to be rational. We tried to go with our frontal lobes. Again, it really boils down to a couple of pretty simple questions, right? Are vaccines effective and are they safe? Well, it's not new for humanity to have people who have very different perceptions of something. You know, we've talked about in chapter one, this notion of we are spirits in the material world. Are we souls and sort of angels or are we biological machines like a materialist would say, or are we something in the middle like Descartes would say, a dualistic view, 
right? Philosophers have had different views on things for a long time. Psychology, what's, what's it add that philosophy doesn't? Science. It adds empirical investigations that where you take these ideas and you look for predictions they make and you see if those predictions hold up. And the view that makes the most accurate predictions is the one we we lean towards, right? These sound like pretty straightforward, different views where we can pull those apart. Are vaccines affect? So yeah, sorry. Just just to say, sometimes we have you know full out experiments. Sometimes it's more data. Some of the stuff we're going to talk about now is somewhere in between. We can't do pure experiments in a world of a deadly virus. We can't really just say, hey, we're going to take you guys and, okay, this side of the room, we're going to call the control group. This side of the room, we're going to call the experimental group. Let's say you were randomly assigned, so we have no reason to believe there's any difference. Um, these guys get a vaccine. You guys don't. And now we're going to close the door and flood it with coronavirus, all right, and see what happens. And we'll collect the data. We'll see how many of you guys get sick, and we'll see how many of you guys get sick. That would be the perfect experiment to see if the vaccine works, right? We can't quite do that. But these randomized group trials, what they do is they take a bunch of people and they give them the vaccine. And a bunch of people that are not in the control trials, we know are not getting the vaccine because we haven't given it to them. And then we just let people live their life and we say, okay, which of these groups contracts the virus a lot more? And those 99% effective numbers you've heard from very early on, we're just saying, hey, the people that get the vaccine are much, 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 much less likely to get the virus. All right. Should be a closed book. If that wasn't enough, you know, we can just look at the more recent stuff we're seeing. How many people in ICUs are vaccinated and how many aren't? You see the data on CP24 every day. And from what I can tell, it's somewhere around 80 to 85% of the people in ICUs are non-vaccinated. About 15% are vaccinated. Um, that's pretty powerful. That's a pretty freaking powerful result. That surely shows the vaccine is effective, right? How can you argue against that? Well, eventually, you're going to argue by picking that third option, as we talked about. But let's come back to that. This is the third option. Eventually, people start saying, I don't think there even is a pandemic. And you say, but Alberta is sending people from their hospitals to Ontario because they don't have enough space in their hospitals. It's not a pandemic. And, and this isn't just Alberta. We know it's happening all over the world, right? And they say, no. And you say, what? What do you mean it's not happening? They're all lying. They're all lying? All the nurses, all the doctors, they're lying? Yeah, they're all lying. The politicians, the scientists, the journalists, they're all lying? Yes, they're all lying. This is the price, as you'll see, of being a conspiracy theorist these days. So let's keep this one around and let's just talk about the other two for a second. Are vaccines effective? Again, I've just talked to you about some of, some of the data that's around. This is such an easy yes. I mean, it's such an easy yes. Um, that is clearly very effective. We see it in all sorts of situations, repeated the world over, replicated many times. You know, there's no doubt the vaccine is effective. Is it safe? We always have to be careful with this question. We have to be very careful to never take the position, yes, it's 100% safe. Why? Because that's stupid. Nothing is 100% safe. Leaving your home in the morning is not 100% safe. There are side effects of leaving your home. The moment you leave your home, things can happen to you that won't happen in your home. You know, anything, any intervention, especially any medical intervention, has potential complications or side effects. So we certainly can't just say it's 100% safe. But we can say, well, let's see. And here's where I want to point you to things like this. If you just click on this link, this is a website. I'm not going to go through it in a lot of detail. There's a lot of these around. This one's Johns Hopkins University. And what I want to point out is they're, they're kind of taking on this question, but they're taking it on in a very, I think, trans, transparent, honest way. Is it safe? They start talking about the side effects we've seen, like myocarditis. That happens. Swelling of the heart. We've seen it. It's a real symptom, especially of the J&J &J, uh, vaccine. And so you can get all the information about that and how that all works. 
um, with the rare side effects. So you can get a sense of the, how likely that side effect is, what happens to people who get it. So for myocarditis, for example, most of them recover perfectly fine. They have a, a brief period of discomfort, um, but then it comes back. Um, but, it, but we go into details with links to, to recognized um, data and research every step of the way. This is the right way to address the safety question. This and comparing it to the safety of not getting vaccinated, right? It's not enough just to say, what's the dangers of getting vaccinated? Well, what are the dangers of not getting vaccinated? And we have to compare those side by side and do a risk benefit analysis. If just about anybody does that in a rational, thoughtful way, it's clear that it's much, 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 much more safe to get the vaccine than to not, okay? Um, and, and that data is, again, readily transparent. And I think that is the right way for us to answer that question. So, you know, when, when you kind of look at the data in those ways, you think, yeah, it's effective. And yeah, it's, it's pretty darn safe. In fact, it's probably the safest vaccine we've ever made. In fact, the vaccine doesn't even include the virus. You know, when you get the NMRA vaccines, the virus isn't even there. Um, it just looks like the virus, looks enough, has these little spike proteins that it puts around your cells that look like the virus. And your immune system's like, hey, who are you guys? You're not supposed to be here. We're gonna kick your butt and we're remembering you from now on. Anybody like you comes around these parts again, we're gonna kick your butt hard. And so if the virus, the actual virus comes around, which looks like that, then the immune system attacks that virus. That's how it works. They've been saving lives and eliminating diseases for decades. Um, if you like Neil Young, Neil Young suffered from polio when he was young, spent a lot of time at Sick Kid Hospital in Toronto. Nobody's suffering from polio anymore. Nobody, that might be extreme, but not very many. Um, it's been all but eradicated and it used to affect all sorts of children all over the world. Um, that's just one example. Uh, this vaccine is safer than any of those. Uh, it's the safest vaccine we've ever made. It's probably safer than the hot dog that you had for, for lunch um, in terms of what you put in your body. Um, so, you know, something to think about. Um, so it should, be, it should be a no brainer. You shouldn't be able to contest these, right? Science should say, we, I, I know you guys are hesitant, but, but it's fine. Have you, you tried convincing an anti-vaxxer that their position is wrong using rational arguments? And if so, how did it turn out? With this one, you can just touch your answer wherever you want to be. You just touch the face um, that represents how that conversation went with you if you tried to do it rationally with that other person. Thanks a lot to all those playing at home, by the way. It's so cool to see uh, so many answers when I know there's more. This reminds me of the whole Nicki Minaj situation. I don't even know what the Nicki Minaj situation is, so I'll, I'll ignore that one for now. Um, so interestingly, they've been fed misinformation, but they still act surprisingly stubborn when presented with something that proves what they knew was false. This is where we're kind of at, right? This is what we're kind of talking about. So let's see, let's do the responses here. Here we go. So for a few of you, it was excellent. That's cool. Um, good chunk, had great conversations. That's cool. That's good to know. You know, it's good to know that people can still have conversations even though they have differing views and they don't walk away stomping their feet. That hasn't been my experience. <laughs> I've walked away stomping my feet. My experience would be extremely poor. You know, I've come to the opinion, just don't do this. It's not good. You're only gonna drive yourselves apart. Like for my sister, for example, I don't want to bring I don't want to talk to her. I don't want to bring this up because we're just going to say more hurtful things to each other. We're just going to be nasty and we're going to make the gulf and I don't want to make the gulf wider. Um, so it's often doesn't work. It's hard to do the rational convincing. I, I wish it were easy, but just like this says, there's this whole lot of stubbornness. There's this certainty that they're right, that they understand and see something we don't see. And part of that is about um, the price of changing your opinion. The price of being an anti-vaxxer and the resistance humans have to changing their opinion. So we can go back to Socrates. It's better to change an opinion than to persist in a wrong one. That's a very rational position to have. It's not a very emotional position to have. Emotionally, emotion is strong in us. When we change a position that we've publicly declared, we feel stupid. 
We feel embarrassed. We feel like we were stupid, et cetera. We don't like to admit to ourselves that we were really stupid. We don't, it just doesn't feel good. And it turns out that the mind will do some amazing things to not reach that conclusion. It's an area of work called cognitive dissonance in psychology. And there's a whole bunch of stuff to learn about it. And I can't give you the whole, um, I can't give you the whole story at this time, but you get the idea here. When a mental conflict occurs between beliefs uh, that are now contradicted by new information. So if you have certain beliefs and now you get this data that goes against what you believe, uh, this con conflict activates areas of the brain involved in personal identity and emotional response to threats. That's the limbic system we're talking about. Um, the brain's alarms go off when a person feels threatened on a deeply personal and emotional level, causing them to shut down and disregard any rational evidence that contradicts what they previously argued as true. Um, they were really, really resistant. We will find ways of bending everything but what we believe. So, okay, I still believe these vaccines are, are not good. I still believe they're dangerous. I believe they're evil. So how do I explain the fact that 95% of the people in hospitals are unvaccinated? Easy. It's not true. Well, some of these people are worried about spike proteins that are on the vaccine. They say they could be dangerous. And, and people have argued back to them, well, if you're worried about spike proteins, they only live for a very short period of time in the, in the uh, vaccine. But if you get the coronavirus, they're going to reproduce in your body like heck. And if you're worried about those spike proteins, you better get the vaccine and make sure you don't get coronavirus. I, I use this on my sister. Her notion was there is no coronavirus. There is no coronavirus. No, it's been like blown out of proportion. It's tiny. It's not even, it doesn't even really exist. It's like, oh. <laughs> but what, what do you do? In fact, the price, as I've already alluded to you, this is now the cost of being an anti-vaxxer. So I like to say you can't paint them all with one brush, and you can't. There are some that were just hesitant, some that just needed a little bit more time, et cetera. But increasingly over time to remain an anti-vaxxer, in, in light of all the data con contradicting that view, you've had to start to go here, if not fully here. This is almost the only way where you can retain the notion that it's right to be an anti-vaxxer. So remember, we started with worries about big pharma, but now it's gotten huge. It's, it's worries about medical experts and the media and scientists and political figures. Um, they're all in on it. It's this huge global, conf um, what's it called? Conspiracy, global conspiracy with all of these people. And, and I'm sitting here thinking, wait a minute, these reporters? These doctors, these people you're talking about, they were my students. I know these people. Those people that go into journalism, they really care about telling stories, about sharing what's going on in the world. That's why they went into it. Why have they, how have they suddenly been converted to the dark side? What is their motive? How is this all organized and structured? Nobody has ever kept a conspiracy like this secret in any way without any paper trail or any data or anything, et cetera. It's absolutely ridiculous. And yet this is, if you believe all this stuff, then you can retain your view that the vaccine is evil. It's a very extreme position to have, a very uncomfortable position to have, but that's where they go to. And you cannot rationally argue now because they say all the data you're throwing at me, it's not true. Okay. We're, we're coming near the end of this. I know I still went a little long, but I can't. Um, yeah, anyway, <laughs> this is what happens with a live lecture sometimes. Okay, so why isn't that working? You know, why? So we're still left in this situation. What do we do? If we can't use data, if we can't use rational arguments, if we can't do it with our frontal lobes, if we're not going to convince them with our frontal lobes, how do we convince them? I'm telling you, they're being fueled by their emotional centers in their brain. That's what fuels their position. There's a threat, there's a danger, there's a global conspiracy, there's all this evil afoot, and we're the ones that know about it and are doing something about it. Uh, and so they feel there's a real justification to that, but it's an emotion-fueled position to have. So what do you do when someone's holding an emotional-fueled position that you think is wrong and you can't convince them it's wrong? You start to use emotional counterattacks. 
So uh, I'll point to a couple of things. This is just sort of where we are today, like in the last week or two, or et cetera. I don't know if you guys have been seeing more posts like this on social media, posts where, where people are sort of making fun of anti-vaxxers in a sense. Um, this is the, it's like the vaccinated have sat there quietly for a while and allowed this all to happen. And now the vaccinated people are getting angry. There's an enough is enough kind of view. And so we see things like this, where we're attacking that view that a lot of anti-vaxxers have, where they say, well, who cares what Andy, uh, Anthony Fauci says? I've done my own research and I think he's wrong. You've done your own research that you, where you think a guy that's been a virologist who's dealt with like six different plagues and managed everything, you know things better than he does? Okay, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, and so, you're seeing a lot of poking fun at some of the positions they have around freedom and around other things, which we could talk about, but we're also starting to see this. And I think this is an important transition. I used to feel like my side of the story needed to be told to keep the facts right. Now I don't care what you choose to believe. There is a point, and, and when I talk to the media, I like to compare it to this. Uh, I don't know if this is true of your family, but in my case, if there was something I wanted that I knew my dad would be opposed to, there would, there would always be a certain way things would play out. You know, I would start by arguing my position. He would, he would argue back. Um, I would argue him. He would argue back. We'd go on for a while. It would start to get a little heated. And at some point, dad would say, enough. That's it. My house, my rules. If you ever want to drive my car again, then you're going to do what I say. And then I'm like, <laughs> and you say, blah, 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 blah. But I just, no, that's it. I run this place. And this is the rules. This is where we're at, kind of. And when you're in that position, right, when you're me now, it's like, well, I really wanted that, but I really want the car too. I really want to be able to take that car out. Now I'm put in this position where I have to make a choice between two emotionally important things to me, the car or whatever I was arguing about. We are now putting them, the anti-vaxxers, in that position. And it's a horrible position. It's unfortunate we're doing it, but we're doing it. And this is it, it's the vaccine passport. Super, super powerful. The vaccine passport, we're just telling them, listen, we're not arguing with you anymore. Enough is enough. We think the vaccine is the only way out of here. We think it's safe. We think it's effective. We think you're being ridiculous. And so you can continue to be ridiculous, but you don't get the car on Friday. Well, okay, not the car, but you don't get the restaurant. You don't get the club. You don't get the pub. You don't get all these things that are part of civilized society because you're not willing to do your role as a citizen. We are, for the first time I can ever remember, creating second-class citizens. Normally, we avoid that. We're really sensitive to social equity. We don't want any group to feel inferior. We don't want to treat them differently. We want social equality. And we're usually fighting against any sort of inequality, but not this time. This time we're creating it. We're saying we are going to give privileges to people who have the vaccine that will be denied to people who don't. This is that tough emotional position for them. So suddenly, and, and, and we're seeing, by the way, two reactions, by the way. You're seeing the temper tantrum, which I probably sometimes did with dad too. <laughs> sometimes when I didn't get my way, I was probably like, ah! angry and whatever and went storming off did i still do what he said in the end or not maybe you know i don't know but but other times i just acquiesced i just lost i knew the car was important to me i wanted to take that out and so it's like okay i'm gonna acquiesce we're seeing acquiescence we always see acquiescence with a vaccine passport yes you see the crazy temper tantrums happening in social media but we're also seeing people take up the vaccine, first dosers increasing, et cetera. These are people saying, okay, I've had this anti-vax flag waving for a while, but man, I wanna do those things, man, whatever. So maybe I will just quietly get my vaccine. And here's my message to all of us. We started this lecture with, these are our brothers, sisters, fellow citizens. What do we do now? We don't take a victory lap. If we see this working, if we see unvaccinated people being vaccinated, we say thank you. We, 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 that's the attitude we have to have. That's what we need. We need you guys to help us reach herd immunity. And if you're willing to take that step and get the vaccine, even grudgingly, even if you still hold out some grr about it, if you do it, then we're thankful. 
I do not want, when this is all over, to gloat to my sister that she was wrong. That's stupid. And it's not good for a relationship. And it's not going to make her feel good. It's not going to make me feel good. What I want is a future where we just don't talk about this anymore. And, and that's what I kind of think we all have to hold. We all have to have this notion of grace uh, at this point. We've really dropped a cudgel on them. And I don't think everybody knows how much of a cudgel this is. Not only are we denying them access to certain things, we are explicitly making them feel like second-class citizens. These people will literally feel like, wow, those guys all hate us. They're denying us stuff that other people are having. That's not fair. It is an emotional, difficult, difficult position. And I regret that we're doing this. You know, I regret that we have to do it while at the same time believing it's the right thing to do. It's what we have to do now. So I have those two feelings, but it's very uncomfortable. And when those people fight their way through and come to the vaccine side of things, we have to just be thankful. And the less we bring it back up, the less we put it in their face, the sooner we can all go on towards this sort of post-pandemic existence that we all want um, and have wanted all along. We want our brothers and sisters back um, and, and we have to accept them back gracefully um, and, and not make them feel guilty or stupid or anything like that, because that just won't help. All right, Whew. a little longer than expected maybe, but that's, that's the end of the first lecture. So thank you very much.